D.C. at the Objectivist Conference. It's the final day, and we've got a hell of a show to take us out. Uh, we're going to be talking about literature. Who needs it? Uh, let's meet some of our co-hosts and guests, and of course, leave a like, hit the join button, and send us some serious super chats. We need your money now more than ever. Uh, we've got an intellectual strategist extraordinaire. He's written more books than some people have read. It's Don Watkins. <laughs> And then we've got somebody who uh, possibly knows the life of Ayn Rand more than Ayn Rand did herself. It's literature and uh, Ayn Rand unofficial biographer, Shoshana Milgram. Then we've got, uh, well, what can I say? She reads poetry, she teaches literature. It's Lisa Van Dam. We've got a first-time guest on the network. Um, he's here, and I'm looking forward to finding out why. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Joseph Tbilishkin. <laughs> first question, what is your last name? Benkin. Tbenkin. All right, so, um, all right. Yeah, thank you. So let's uh, talk about literature. I guess uh, we can start with uh, Shoshana. You've... Um, You've written a lot about Ayn Rand's early uh, works, right? Like the early versions of the Fountainhead and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, since this is the Ayn Rand Center UK, maybe that's a good starting point. Like, what makes you interested in what the Fountainhead was before it became the final version? Okay. Well, one reason that I'm interested in the record of a writer before the book becomes final is that after we become accustomed to reading something, it can seem as if it's metaphysical as in the sense that it's always been here, that the fountainhead was always the fountainhead. And of course, that is the canonical version. That's the final version. But looking at other versions allows you to see what she ended up with as a foil for what she finally did. You, know, you pay attention to what the process was, and therefore it becomes a double adventure. You know, there's the achievement of the fountainhead, what it is. There's the act of achievement of Ayn Rand. And of course, for us as readers, there's the achievement of doing justice to it. One of my students once said that uh, she, she felt that she'd accomplished something just by reading Alice Schmidt, which I thought was certainly something to be the case. You know, they say sometimes it changes your life, and not just because it occupies so much of your life to read it, okay? But spending more time in the creative work, I think, does help you to get closer, and the closer you get, the better it looks. Yeah, I, uh, I've... Uh, we heard Peter Schwartz speak earlier about like the method of how people arrive at their position as being as important than just what their position is. If I'm you know summarizing correctly, and I've I've made the observation that like or I learned that I, to know a philosophy is to know how it developed, and I guess the same is true like to really know a, a work of literature, um, like knowing how it developed and maybe knowing about the author too can really give you the full experience. I suppose, Lisa, any any thoughts on that? I'm going to leave that one to the boss over here. I do, I do a lot less in search of the biographical context or the background of the story and more just immerse myself and my students in the story itself. So, so yeah, so what makes you so enamored with literature? You obviously, it's such a big part of your life. Isn't it isn't like TV and movies like just as good or better at times? <laughs> uh, well, TikTok. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was not always a reader myself, so it was a discovery that came as uh, thanks to Leonard Peikoff. And so I've, I've been through the process of not really understanding what the value was in a personal way, and then having him guide me through the eight great plays and, and making that discovery, and then continuing in that discovery process ever since. And guiding through students through it certainly helps me understand it more deeply. Um, what is the so so the topic of the show has now become why literature as opposed to TikTok? Right. <laughs> or just why literature? Why literature? Um, this is a, a fascinating question, difficult to answer simply, and I'm really eager to hear the other panelists' takes on it. But 
One of the concepts that's become very valuable to me in literature is the idea of intellectual disciplines, and that each of the kind of traditional subjects gives us a certain perspective on the world, a certain access point to the world, a certain way of, of understanding life. And so math is different from science, is different from literature, and literature has its own distinct value to a human being as a way of conceptualizing, viewing, experiencing, seeing the world. So what that discipline is, is tricky to identify, but one of, and I want to hear others about it, but one of the aspects is certainly being able to look out into the world and see it in terms of essentials. That's what a great artist, author has done for us. And there's a profound pleasure in just being able to experience a world like that, where all the extraneous is removed and everything is purposeful and everything is deliberate and beautifully captured. And that's just an enjoyable process. But it's not just an enjoyable process. Making it that way is what makes people think of it as escapism. Like, that's not what the world is like. So I can retreat into a book to do that. Um, instead, I think of it as a pleasure in itself that then allows you to do that when you return to the real world with all its extraneous details and kind of see to the essence of things, the meaning behind things, the values, they just sort of glow. What what matters and what what is actually important to you starts to kind of glow in the environment around you rather than being uh, clouded by the extraneous details. Okay. Uh, Joseph, what brings you to the show today? You want me to say why you're at the show? Right? I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'm the one who invited him, so I'll Good. say it. So Joseph is the person who designed the Read With Me app for me, the app that um, I'm using to help get introduce people to literature and help, help them emotionally connect with classic works of literature. And Joseph, the reason he designed the app is he was a consumer of my material when I was just posting it on YouTube and really wanted this for himself and wanted it readily available for himself because he was not a reader. Um, and just the other morning, he's doing the Les Miserables chapter a day project that, that I did last year. He's just doing it now. And he, he texts, so every morning, I'm gonna let you tell the story. I'm, I'm not gonna just talk about Joseph. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, the whole time. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> this, this context is becoming very long. Um, but he, he texted me the other morning. He wakes up in the morning. He does his Les Miserables reading. And he had been contemplating, you know, personal things that came up at the conference and, and thought, oh, this reading that I did this morning was really instructive um, and clarifying and helpful in a way that only something literary can be for thinking about whatever issue of the day it was. Um, so anyway, I thought it would be fun to have, you know, we've got a, a writer, a literature professor, a literature teacher. I thought it'd be good to have someone who's very new to literature and discovering the value of it for himself. Yeah. So Joseph, you're, <laughs> you're an app developer, you're a businessman, you're busy creating stuff and, uh, you know, making money. Like what, what, why are you, why do you have time for stories? So I make time. Um, and I'll just plug the Les Mis project because it's been so, so valuable at, in so many ways. So Lisa uses the term soul stretching as part of the role of literature. And one of the most delightful things about the past, I think I'm on day 60 or so, has been really experiencing concretely what soul stretching means. Um, so, you know, if you've read Les Mis, just following the bishop and seeing how kind he is and um, the impact he has on Jean Valjean. And I had the, ended up being pleasure of going to the passport office last month uh, <laughs> to renew my passport and arriving at 3 a.m. to be the last person they saw that day. And in the back of my mind, I had the bishop there to just help me be a little bit more kind and benevolent through this really challenging process. You know, everyone was sleep deprived and exhausted and um, pulling their hair out and dealing with this bureaucracy. And it's kind of wanted to try and be this little ray of positivity in it. So um, that idea of soul stretching it and um, was very, I was very acutely aware of it. And, you know, Hugo was an amazing at helping you see that in a concentrated form. And then you carry that with you. And I'm hoping Shoshana will be able to quote this line exactly. But the line from the Fountainhead, 
when the boy is going through the forest and um, he says, you know, men have not found the words for it, but they've found the music. Yes. Um, that always stuck with me because music was my always my expression uh, until I discovered words like Ayn Rand and I said, oh, they have the words. I just didn't, wasn't looking in the right place. Yeah, and they have the music. Too. <laughs> yeah, they have the music. <laughs> Yeah, Don. So, Don, you're you're trained in objectivism. You're highly knowledgeable in philosophy. You've written on politics and culture and and philosophy and all these very real reality-based things. And now you're writing novels. Like, why? What? Well, like, again, who has time for stories and and pleasure and all that art? I mean, you're 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 living in the real world, right? You got the world to save. So, uh, so how do you explain this? Uh, the, the time you're spending writing novels. Well, I mean, my story is very similar to Lisa's. Like, all of my access to art was just basically, like, movies, TV, and, like, detective novels. And it was, I was gripped by something that had action. And so, with Atlas Shrug and the Fountainhead, it was different because when I found those, oh, there's good ideas here. But then Ayn Rand's talking about reading Victor Hugo and these people. I'm like, but they don't have the right ideas. Like, everything for me was either learning or, like, action-packed, very kind of perceptual level adventure. And then my guide into literature was Lisa. And part of what came out of it and part of why it became a really deeply important part of my life is Ayn Rand in the introduction to Fountainhead talks about the way in which religion has monopolized our most profound emotions mm -hmm. like reverence and exaltation and so on. And then that's properly held for a moral ideal. But I think to actually experience those emotions in your life, it's through literature and through the way literature teaches you to look at life. And so, it, like, to actually live these ideas, you need art and, as an integral part to it. And so, as somebody who wrote a bunch of nonfiction, I reached a point where I said, I love helping people clarify their thinking, but at the end of the day, there's something that, um, like, I don't just want to help use Ayn Rand's ideas to clarify things. I want to say something very personal myself and have that kind of deep impact on people that great art has had on me. Yeah, so maybe you can tell by some of these questions where I'm like kind of like disparaging literature, kind of like tongue in cheek, like who has time for this? But I'm kind of fishing for like uh, you know what I'm what I'm hearing, which is like art is more fundamental. It impacts us and it drives us more. There's a scene from The Fountainhead that always comes to mind where I think Tuhi is confronting Gail Wynand and says something like, "Oh, you stick to your celebrity gossip and politics." You know, leave the leave the theater and the symphony and the books to me. Like, uh, like you think you're in control of this culture, you're manipulating things. Like, it's me who like who decides which art is is in. That's like I'm the one really uh, controlling the world because he's he's reaching, uh, you know, I guess people's souls. He's uh, he's affecting their ethics and how they view the world and and their capacity to attain self-esteem. Uh, could uh, I guess Shoshana, we can come back to you. Uh, how how would you? Uh, describe the effect that art has on people and maybe literature specifically uh, in, in, in terms of that, like how we view the world and how it drives us in the direction. Yeah. Well, to begin with, it's fine for you to ask those questions because there's always a role for a devil's advocate. So here he is, Mr. <laughs> devil's Advocate. I, 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 just saying, um, I, I think that what Lisa said before, in a way we're kind of writing each other's scripts because she talked about, you know, what you already explained it, you know, what, what the way that uh, literature can make you more aware of what's going on in the text and then outside the text. And so you're always looking for the fundamentals and you're looking for the meaning and what is there that is fundamental and important and inspiring and invigorating beyond the clutter. You know, that's the, I mean, it's bad art if it's cluttered. You've probably read too much art that's cluttered and seen too many movies that are cluttered. But in, in good art, it's not clutter. It's all supposed to be there, and it helps. It's integrated. It's intense. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way to experience the world. I was going to uh, tell an Ayn Rand story when you were talking about the passport office. And it's not, well, because Ayn Rand had her own problems getting passport, right? But, but this is a little different. Um, this is a story that she remembered herself of when she and Frank were driving trying to drive from California to New York for what was going to be night of January 16th. Do you know the story? It's very lucky. There was, there was a bad car accident, which they survived. But while she was there with the totaled car and on, you know, dealing with getting the car towed and getting themselves to the bus and all of that, she, you know, she's outside the car and she saw a southern mansion with pillars 
And she started thinking about that scene in the Fountainhead, you know, with uh, Dominique and the quarry, and there was a chain gang there, which, I mean, it's not actually as if Les Mis sent some characters there to inspire I mean, <laughs> the scene, but she said, you know, she was just so interested in her story that she didn't really care about the car. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, I'm interested in biography, so yeah, I, I got a look at what the receipt looked like with the titled car, and they did, yeah, and it was actually not all that far from where I live, although I've not been able to recreate, certainly not tried to recreate the accident. Yeah, but there, were, <laughs> but there were stories in the news about the bad weather that day, and so, you know, big uh -huh. water and so on. But that isn't actually what mattered to Ayn Rand. What mattered to Ayn Rand was that she thought, oh, I can think about my book. And, of course, the book is going to be there long after the car and the bus are gone. And... As you know, that's one of the things that she said in the 1968 intro to The Fountainhead. People asked her if, you know, she always knew that the book was going to live. And she said, as Victor Hugo said, that, um, you know, if I thought I were writing for only my time, I would break my pen and throw it away. <laughs> yeah. So, well, part of what I like about that is, of course, she's connecting herself with Hugo. And she's also, without quite doing the Chateaubriand reference, she's mm -hmm. also, you know, placing her... We're in the same business, yeah, and, yeah. We, and we look at things the same way, mm -hmm. which also reminds me that you were saying you're not a scholar, but the talk that uh, that Lisa gave at this conference, which I'm sure at some point is going to show up for the world, actually did contextualize, you know, it's you go Rostand, Hernani, and how to be a romantic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the full title in there, right? Yeah. Yes. And um, which is, I think, meaningful. It's uh, you know how different writers can matter to each other, mm -hmm. and how a writer can matter to you, and then how you can matter to the rest of us. There is an artistic perspective there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about meaning and, and significance and matter. Mm -hmm. Art, art, and romantic love were hugely important to Ayn Rand, right? Like there was no life separate from those two things. It seems like. Um, and just to think, like, how much our lives have been impacted by the fact that Ayn Rand's car crash was not fatal that day. Um, here we are, and, you know, we're as far from Ayn Rand now than maybe she was from Hugo, give or take, right? It's pretty amazing. Um, Lisa, so you, you became like an art uh, aficionado uh, thanks to Leonard Peikoff's influence. Did you then kind of reverse engineer some of your, like, your values and, and notice the way that art had, had impacted you in, in some ways earlier in life? Uh, oh, earlier in life. That's interesting. Um, Definitely, I could trace the experience I had taking eight great plays to a few scattered experiences over the course of my life, like walking into the room and having my father sit me down next to him and with a tone of real reverence in his voice say, you have to watch this with me because To Kill a Mockingbird, the film, had come on the, on the TV. And he, he definitely had this capacity to revere a great work of art and be emotionally moved by it. And I, I can, obviously that stood out in my memory, which is very poor, unlike Shoshana's. Uh, so it was something significant to me. Um, but mostly I look back and just see myself as utterly deprived of, of what I ought to have been given when it comes to the arts. And in, when Rosie and I were talking about the topic for today, I, I really wanted the question on the table to be, is literature essential to a human life? Not just, is it a value, but is it actually essential? Um, my view is that it is, and I don't think it's, I think I already confessed that in the lecture, <laughs> so it's no big surprise here, but even though we have a variety of arts and people are going to gravitate towards one or the other, I do believe that that literature is essential cognitive, moral, spiritual training for a human being. Um, I don't think it's something that someone needs to choose as their go-to art, art form throughout their life, but I do think everybody ought to have had it as part of their childhood education. And then if, they, if they're given that, and they're given it in a, in a proper and meaningful way, they're going to come away with a certain way of thinking and experiencing life and valuing that will stay with them forever, whether they continue reading uh, for, for the years beyond. So I'm just curious. I, I wanted to hear what Don and Shoshana felt about that. 
No, I mean, I agree with that completely. That the question I was going to ask, well, I was going to start with you mm-hmm. because you're yeah. helping Lisa yeah. like uh, <laughs> get her whole approach to unlocking literature for people. What are the, we've indicated that there's a way of like getting more out of literature than just reading the, the, the words like you would read a detective novel. Like there's a real thinking about it and you kind of helped her draw out those lessons for people. What, what have you learned about how to unlock literature from your own experience and from working with Lisa? Mm. And obviously I want to get the experts on that as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, Started off. Yeah, start off. Um, I feel, I, I bet there are a lot of people who feel the same way that I do, that I feel like my, uh, there was an active destruction of my ability to appreciate literature. It wasn't just neglect, it was damage done. Because literature, to the extent that it was taught at all in my schools, it was like something that was being checked off as a curriculum responsibility. It was the, whoever was teaching it didn't have a true emotional connection to the story themselves or spiritual. It wasn't for the, the, the soul stretching of it that they were reading it. It was like, um, this is what it means to be an educated person is that you've read. And it, it just felt very soulless and dry and mechanical. And so I had very few experiences where I actually felt moved by it. I think that was that was probably the transformation of the, of the experience of, having Leonard Peikoff teach me literature is I learned that it's a deeply moving experience if you're reading it correctly and reading the right things. Um, so that the guidance that I, and there's so many differences in the, in the way we approach the read with me format from the usual ones. One of which is I take readers inductively through the process of reading the book. If you get something like Cliff's notes, it'll start with a character description. Well, if you're, but it also has summaries of all the chapters and questions at the end of the chapters, but the character descriptions usually come at the right. beginning. Um, so we're, we're, it's this weird uh, juxtaposition of um, things that you're supposed to know when you finish the novel and things that you're supposed to be deciphering as you go along, and there's not a clear differentiation between those two. So I just think of myself as kind of hand-holding people through the process having them pay attention to what's important, having them put the pieces together as they go along, and also to respond, to, <laughs> to connect with what it is you're reading. So I spend a lot of time on Read With Me just talking about my favorites. I loved this line, and here's why, and model. You should be on that premise when you're reading, too. Yeah, and, and concretize that a little bit, too. Like, what does it look like? What have we been conscious about, especially in this new project, to help... Lisa handhold you through it. So, for example, uh, in this new project, Lisa will read the book to you. Um, but I'm sure we've all had that experience, hence with anything new, but you know, in literature, of immersing ourselves in the new world, especially if there's unfamiliar character names. Um, you know, maybe the language is is more challenging, and that can become a very big hurdle. Um, you know, to stay focused and attentive. And not even just get the most out of it, but just follow along and and get into it. So in this new app, I'm very conscious that Lisa pauses to emphasize, for example. So she'll be reading and all of a sudden she'll stop to explain something or help you make a little integration and notice something. And I got a quote here because I'm starting, it's it's already bleeding into my own life as I'm reading Late Miss. I, you know, she mentioned I'm kind of been thinking about something the other day and I got to this chapter and I took note of this, like, because of how Lisa is, and so this is how Hugo essentially starts one of the chapters. Um, it's no more possible to prevent thought from reverting to an idea than the sea from returning to the shore. With the sailor, this is called the tide. With the culprit, this is called remorse. God heaves the soul like the ocean. And then he goes on to show you Jean Valjean torturing himself over a dilemma he has. And going back, and you just see this beautiful description of what we've all gone through when we've had a difficult, you know, difficult moral decision, and the rationalizations we make. And most authors might spend two pages on it, and Hugo spent ten or fifteen on it. Um, uh, so, you know, that's the kind of thing that you know, just to do the arc. You know, it starts with Lisa modeling it for us, and you know, trying to capture those principles, and then. The hope is when somebody just picks up the book themselves, they can 
spot things like that. Yeah, we got a couple super chats. Uh, Jonathan Honig with 19.99, and then Kathleen with two pounds says, "Was lucky to have a great English literature teacher at school." I've always had mixed feelings about like, you know, like reading Ayn Rand in school and stuff like that, which I did not. Like I read it during high school, but very much by myself. Um, and like, so in my life, you know, growing up in Jerusalem in a religious, very secluded religious environment, to me, books were like the escape. It was almost like, uh, like the guy in Anthem, you know, finding these, uh, hidden treasures in the libraries and, uh, and it was like a journey into this other world. And, uh, so to like, to send out to like, to see like, um, like objectivists and, and other kind of pro, literally pro-life people now raising kids sending them to great schools where they learn the richness of literature is like it almost to me it's hard for me to even uh i don't know it's like are they getting the full experience are they getting the independent experience so at least i'm seeing some some mm-hmm. thoughtful nods any thoughts on that so you're wondering whether it's the same <laughs> experience if it's being led as if you're like you felt like this was a private discovery that you had made on your own in the hands of a good teacher i think it's a better experience oh no <laughs> but, really yeah does that you're, you feel skeptical? Of it's that? hard to wrap my mind around that, but uh, yeah. Okay. I think it depends on what it means by the hands. Yeah. Because I, you know, if the teacher leads you into the text as opposed to out of it, yeah. then you know, in, in effect, you're reading the work more than once. Yeah. And I think that part of the effect of your reading something allows that people are getting it more than once because they're hearing you read it and then they read it on their own and then they read it with commentary and so it's uh, it's getting closer it's missing less it's sure. see, it's slowing down slowing down is a good thing well uh, i had i had a wonderful english teacher when i was in 8th grade mrs shankman and i i did not keep in touch with her as well as i might but i did call her when i was in washington and told her what i was doing and that I had turned out to be in literature. But I remember, I still remember being in the classroom and her reading things aloud to us Mm -hmm. and her encouraging us to get close to the words. And in in fact, during COVID, someone got in touch with me who hadn't seen me physically since probably about eighth or ninth grade. And he had a very vivid memory of my, I don't believe I did this, but we were asked to memorize one stanza from from Evangeline. And I apparently did a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. And so I was up in front of the class, you know, (laughs) little girl just, you know, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring primeval. Yeah, I'm not going to do it for you right now. But, um, but, you know, it's it's a kind of appreciation. And it's not a mechanical thing to memorize it. But if you really know it, and if it's well written, then you'll remember how the writer wrote it with just those words. Yeah. And Mrs. Shankman told us why I think why it had to be in just those words. I have an example to add about that we were talking about yesterday about the value of the teacher. Um, a lot of people, you said, came up to you to say they were holding back tears, right? When you're, and you thought it interesting that people don't feel vulnerable, like don't feel confident enough to be vulnerable. And one thing I think you've talked a lot about is the teacher as the mentor. Mm-hmm. And in this context, you know, they do so many things being that mentor for you, one of which is giving you permission to experience literature in, in this sort of way. Mm-hmm. Um, right? so mentoring, so, not just the, the intellectual content of the book, but the process of reading and valuing. And yeah, so just one example I always give, because there's certainly a place for finding a book on your own and having it be personal to you and having it be a treasure that you're not sharing with anybody else. And I can relate to that, but that seems different from the value of a literature class. So what I usually give as an example is that every year in eighth grade, I teach a story called Bull This Week by Vita Maupassant. It's the story of a prostitute who is in a carriage with a bunch of nuns and nobles and a uh, Democrat, and she's the lowest of society. They're the higher members of society. This it, And the language is sophisticated, and this is um, so remote from their experience. Were they to discover that on a shelf, I would say... Out of 15 students, zero would finish that story. And nevertheless, by the end of the semester, those 15 students were all completely captivated, riveted by the story, shocked by the ending. They come away morally moved, changed by the experience. But they needed me to help them along the process to get that value out of it. So I don't think necessarily those things are at odds with each other. There's just, I just really see the important place for someone to, I just think of it as 
taking, I, I know this thing. I, I can be your guide. I can take you by the hand and lead you through it, um, which is probably different from what you're associating in your mind with the typical English teacher experience. I mean, maybe for me this is bigger than literature. It's like, can yeah. you discover values being led by the adults, or are adults always the enemy, like I mm. came to see them? So maybe that's something to bring up when we have a psychologist yeah. on the show. <laughs> But, but, I mean, I think literature enthusiasts are the closest thing to psychologists that are not psychologists. Mm -hmm. we got a super chat from Enric saying, some go to movies and series bypassing the written. What is the difference that occurs for the reader slash watcher? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Well, I think it would depend on the text mm -hmm. because, you know, some texts require maybe more of a bridge. Mm -hmm. You know, some audiences and texts, there needs to be more of a bridge so that people can be prepared to get what they can. It's also true that the modeling can work to allow people, after having read one piece of art with you, they can then find something else. And yeah. just when you were saying that about you know taking them by the hand, it reminded me of a favorite quotation of mine. And I'll, I'll try to make it quick, but it comes from The History Boys by Alan Bennett. And it's a scene in which there is a teacher working one-on-one -on -one with a student on a poem by Thomas Hardy. And the teacher says, he says, the best moments in reading are when you cross, when you come across something, a word, a phrase, a way of looking at things that you thought special and particular to you, but there it is. Someone has set it down on the page, someone you've never met, maybe even someone long dead, mm -hmm. and it's as if a hand has come out and taken you. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll add watching movies with Lisa is also more fun than doing the lunch. <laughs> She watches the King's Speech with her class and does the same thing with pausing and explaining. And I had to finish it on my own. It wasn't as good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I like that one. <laughs> all right. And we got a super chat from Maria. Can the speakers share one fiction book that had a profound effect on them other than Ayn Rand's writing? <laughs> Just one? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll go first, sure. um, just because it, it's one that people don't tend to know, and yet I think you would enjoy. It's called The Gadfly, and it's by E. L. Voynich, B-O-Y-N-I-C-H. She was actually you know, British-Irish. She was the daughter of Boole, as in Boolean algebra, and this novel is set in Italy. But the way I describe it, I, I say it's something like a cross between the Scarlet Letter, you know, moral, and the Scarlet Pimpernel adventure, and it's... Well, there's suspense in it, there's surprise in it, and it also happens to be anti the church. Uh, and I, I read, I mean, I have, I think it's a 50 cent copy that I read back when I was young. I, I looked at it and I thought, this looks interesting to me. And I've actually always thought that Iran knew this book, but there's a particular thing that makes me think that that would be a spoiler, so I won't say it. <laughs> no. But I, I think, you know, it's, I've read it many times since then. I read all of the author's other books. I wrote a biographical essay on her, tried to figure out. She was very interesting. Her secrets, she ended up in New York, and um, she was married to the Voynich manuscript, that Voynich, the one who discovered a manuscript written all in code, but she's not the same person as her husband. So that's, that, that's a book that I've always, and whenever I start reading it again, next time I look up, <laughs> a couple hours have gone by, mm -hmm. and I'm at the end, I haven't gotten out of it. So I like it, The Gadfly by E. L. Voynich. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a book? Well, I'll name one that I just finished, which is one of the best things I've read in a long time, which is uh, Mark Helfrin's oh. book, Soldier of a Great War, which is uh, was published in, I think, 1991. And it, the, lev the level of, like, stylistically, I think he's brilliant and writes at a high level as any author. And it's, I still, I, I'm... I want to talk to you he about it. Is it ways to tell you about how I wrote to him? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 But um, part of what's fascinating is it's like he his characters are not like larger than life in to the extent of like somebody like a Hugo or Ayn Rand. But it's, I mean, it's very much like, you know, an exciting um, view of life and people that it, it, it's not naturalist. Let's just put it that way. Though I think he, his plots aren't plotty enough to be full romanticism, but I just found it an enormously powerful way of capturing particular moments and facets of people and um, 
also he's really trying to interweave ideas into it in a thoughtful way, even though I disagree with a lot of the ideas he's trying to communicate. Well, in that I think nobility book. is a very good way to describe. Yeah, he's got noble yeah. characters. As far as the plotting, you know, he, his short stories are excellent, and I think it's a little bit of a challenge to put the, the story ideas together into one big book. But I, I think it's just excellent, and there is an Iron Man connection. But we can talk about that another time. I mean, I talk cliffhanger. About cliffhanger. Yeah. Well, I, I, he's great. I, I like him. I think this question feels a little bit like you've asked me which of my children <laughs> do I like the best. Which ones? Um, and, <laughs> uh, since I have four children, I'm going to choose four. <laughs> Literature. Because I do, um, these are the four that it will, that it will depend on the day which I name as my favorite. It's Victor Hugo's 93, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, Rostam, Cyrano de Bergerac, and Rostam's Chanticleer, which I really want to make the topic of a future lecture because that's one that, um, it's, it's about a rooster. It's a play about a rooster <laughs> and a bunch of farm animals. And it seems unlikely that it would be the play that when I have any career struggles in my life, that's what I call to mind. And I find it extraordinarily powerful and moving. So those, those four. Can, yeah. I, can I just say the Read With Me library? Yeah. <laughs> As my one choice. That's <laughs> um, Or Shane. I, maybe. Shane? Shane's been with. Shane's been. Shane, Shane, just Shane. Okay. My Shane's dad. excellence um, is one of my all-time favorites. But I just re I, I keep every time I reread one of them in the app, it becomes my favorite. So, um, and if anyone, you know, has found getting into the literature challenging, I've been like just loving the late as I said before. Like it's been such an accessible way to you know find time each morning. It takes like five minutes, maybe ten some days, to just get a little bit in and also just zoom in on one chapter and allow yourself to be focused for for a little bit um, off the phone and everything and just zoom in on something amazing. It's starting to bleed into other areas of life and help me focus. So late miss chapter a day if that's my recommendation. Nice. I read a book uh, last time I was in Israel when I was uh, 12 or 13. I don't remember what it's called. It was like part of a series. The author is Galila Ron Feder. If any, so maybe someone could figure out which book this was. But uh, it's about a young author, like a teenage boy who he's an aspiring author. And at, at, in this book, he he meets a, a woman and like she takes his virginity and introduces him to her friends who tell him that like he's a generational, you know, prodigy or something. Like every civilization or every generation has like a chosen one and that he shows signs of being that like he's the prophet and you know and this leads the, the main character to start turning his back on his family and to, to plan on moving out and joining his girlfriend and these people and you know going on to their grandiose adventures and then like at the end of the book he like goes to visit them and realizes he's visiting them in a mental institution <laughs> like they're be having medications handed to them and uh you know that that stuff with me <laughs> so uh no other super chats no any questions or comments from the audience before we, we need to wrap um can you describe your uh view of literary heroes if that's in, as being an essential ingredient or not in literature uh, what was the in literary heroes as being and i missed a word an essential component of literature do you, do you mean for an individual's life experience, or are you saying, is it, does a novel have to contain a hero to be worthwhile? The latter. The latter, okay. Um, a hero by yours, by by the reader's standards sure. of, of mm -hmm. heroism. Okay. Um, go ahead, well, Shana. Well, I, I would say that the novel has to have a protagonist, mm -hmm. you know, someone who's running, who's adventures you want to follow, um, but that uh, now, you know, Dostoevsky's novels <laughs> tend not to have admirable protagonists, even by his own standards, <laughs> and yet I don't think that he would say that his work has no literary value, it just has a different literary value. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you're not going to be inspired to do likewise, or as I sometimes say, crime and punishment 
not a how-to book. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, it's still literature. I think that literature in which you do have admiral protagonists or admiral in some respect, you know, do have a particular kind yeah. of joy yeah. and, and inspiration, but it doesn't have to have someone like that in order to be to be a novel or, or even to be a, a, a good novel. If it's a if it if the author is a great soul, one of the things I always tell people is, however much you might disagree with the with their philosophic view on the whole, they are going to point out a million things along the way that are absolutely true, clarifying, illuminating, and ingenious. So they, they it's just they're a great they're a great genius. You can be led astray, but there's still going to be so much that gives you deep insight into life and the world. And um, additionally, their conclusions might be false, but there's if they're a great mind, there's going to be something in the way they're approaching questions or the kinds of questions that they're answering, that they're trying to take on, or the way, the way they use language that you're going to absorb and that's something very positive and, and soul-stretching. So I... Um, I feel a real pleasure reading Crime and Punishment as much at odds as I might feel with the philosophic universe or the, or even the, the tone of the universe. But there's such a pleasure in just being taken along with this great mind and experiencing the world through his eyes. So I come away with the abstract instead of the concrete conclusions, maybe. Yeah, I mean, Rand said of Dostoevsky, right? Like, it's... Being led through a chamber of horrors yeah. with a it's powerful like, guy, and yeah. right. And the question for me is, isn't it great to go through life with a powerful guide? Mm -hmm. And now, if there's heroes involved, to me, that's like that's the stuff I'm going to connect to at the deepest level. But having amazing tour guides through life is a profound value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except it's not a chamber of horrors. <laughs> yes. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have uh, any time left. Uh, Richard in the super chat says, "What are the similar similarities and differences of literature to poetry?" Well, the difference is one is literature and one is poetry. <laughs> yeah. Literature. Oh, that's right. It's like saying the difference between uh, painting and art. Yeah. Yeah. So, good question though. No. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't. We we are out of time. But if any of you want to comment on poetry or versus, let's say, uh, story, you know, novels. Uh, I would say jump in now, but I can tell you what Iran said about poetry. Sure, please, um, she said that either it's you know, you know for her it's either wonderful or it's nothing, and most of the time it's nothing. <laughs> and so, so she, on the other hand, she wrote that to a poet who had sent her a book of his poetry. You probably know the story, right? And she said, and I will tell you, maybe it's a feminine wile that one of the poems in this book I would choose for my epitaph. Wow. Try to guess which one. <laughs> I tried to guess which one, but that's another story. Yeah. Uh, did, it, did we hear it on the 4th of July? Is that the one about the world began when I was no, born? No, okay. that one. This is from earlier. Wow. Okay, uh, Lisa, anything? Very quickly, one of the phrases I like from a writer named Elizabeth Drew is that she says poetry draws on all the resources of language. And so, uh, sound... In, uh, implication of direct meaning and so it, it seems I don't know much more language as a tool mm -hmm. oriented rather than it's harder to translate too. Yeah, yeah for that reason. Much harder. Yeah. Which is why it's lovely that you did a translation. Mm -hmm. yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, from the Joseph end, is there an app about to plug now or yes. that can, yes. Sure, yeah I can plug a few things. So read with me salon.com uh, there's a few things on there. There's you can get access to the Read With Me library. You can also find all of Read With Me on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon. Now we put all of the library on there, um, and we just launched a new service as well for Les Mis. Um, so you can sign up and you can gift it to somebody. Um, you just put your email, credit card information, one-time fee, and you'll just get the Les Mis commentary in your inbox every day. Um, you'll also get the reading. Uh, so it'll just be right there. Though I do recommend finding a really nice copy you can have. But um, yeah, I just recommend the Les Mis project. It's been incredible for me. And, and now you, it, we made it so, so easy, right? You don't have to hunt around just in your inbox. Um, and you can also share it with a friend and buy it for them. So.
All right, speaking of sharing, please share this episode and uh, share your money with us by hitting that super thanks button down below. Thank you all for being here. This was wonderful. Uh, so much wisdom and insight. And he, Joseph, I feel like I got to know the reason for you being here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for being in the audience. Thank you all. See you back here soon. Woo!